Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Ishan Russell and today is a historic day as it marks the centenary of Mahatma Gandhi's return to India from South Africa. As we remember the Mahatma today through various functions and celebrations, to ask what we as a country have done with the legacy of Gandhiji is the real question. Today's independent India is very different from how Mahatma Gandhi imagined it. And given the present state of rhetoric in the country, I think it's high time we revisited the Mahatma's ideas, his legacy and his ideals. And to help us do that, we are joined by veteran journalist, somebody who's seen India change through the times from Mahatma Gandhi's times to the present day, Kuldeep Nair. We're privileged to have with him, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, sorry, him over here with us on this show. We're also joined by Varsha Das. She is the former director of the National Gandhi Museum and eminent writer as well. Professor Midra Mukherjee is a historian uh, at uh, JNU. She joins us live uh, and also we'll be joined by a host of other people. But uh, Mridula Ji, I'll start with you uh, because you wrote uh, an interesting article in a major newspaper today about the real Garvapsi of Mahatma Gandhi's coming home to India and how that is very relevant for India today. Yes, well, what I called it was a different kind of ghar wapsi mm -hmm. from the one that we've been hearing about in recent times and the meaning of that. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do was to understand uh, what Gokhale had pointed out to us, that Mahatma Gandhi had the spiritual power to convert ordinary men and women into heroes and martyrs. Mm -hmm. Where did he get that strength from? So I looked at his South Africa experience from that perspective and tried to bring before us how it was his work with the poorest of the poor, the indentured labor, who were really like slaves, living in miserable conditions with no rights, and his struggle for them and with them, mm. more than anything else, the way he mobilized these people into actually fighting for their own rights. And towards the end of his struggle over there, uh, 50,000 indentured labor, many of whom were coal miners, went on a strike. Mm. So he was really a leader of very poor, uh, very hardworking uh, indentured labor. So mm. he was really a labor leader par excellence. Mm. And I think that's an aspect of Mahatma Gandhi which I wanted to bring to light mm. before us today. And how then he made the, the Ridra Nara in his talisman, mm. you know. And his whole emphasis throughout his life was, whatever we are struggling for, the independence we are struggling for, it only has a meaning if it works for the poor, if it works for the untouchable, if it works for the downtrodden, the women. Mm. So this total concern he had with oppression, mm. fighting against oppression and for justice. Mm. It was much more than just working in any specific situation, either for Indian independence or for the rights of uh, immigrants in South yeah, Africa. It, it became a whole worldview. Yeah, it became that worldview and that worldview we want to talk about and how relevant it is, is it today, Varsha Das? Because in terms of Gandhiji's legacy, what do we in, in, as Indians in 21st century associate Gandhiji with? I mean, you've been the director of the National Gandhi Museum. You've, I mean, spent your life uh, observing uh, what Gandhiji did through his life. So in terms of modern India, how relevant is his legacy and what is exactly is his legacy for a young India like me? Well, certain uh, ideas that Gandhiji... Um, implemented here are um, like timeless, they are eternal. Like for example what Mridila ji said just now that whatever action you take always see how it is going to benefit the last person in the society, poorest of the poor. Mm. If that person is not benefiting then it's not worth uh, you know implementing. I mean, I think this is the eternal truth. If you want to take the uh, country forward, uh, you can't uh, uh, look at only a group of people or a section of the society because country would still remain backward mm. because majority of them are not, uh, uh, um, you know, um, included in this whole process. Also, uh, his fight for justice, his... Uh, fight against exploitation, uh, wanting a life of dignity for each and every person, mm. wanting women to come into the public sphere. All these are 
you know, uh, timeless. Uh, uh, and indeed, radical ideas. Those radical time ideas, was, those days, of course. But of I course. mean, some of them sadly still remain pretty radical till now. We haven't changed that much. We haven't changed. We haven't changed. Actually, uh, it's it's a pity that uh, so much has been forgotten, and uh, uh, focus has shifted, and uh, Gandhi is forgotten. Uh, if we look at even at his Hind Swaraj. Hmm which he wrote in 1909 in his very first book, very slim book. Mm. But it has actually the vision of India. Uh, if, if we are able to take up something also out of it, mm. we can still uh, move for, forward. Here. All right, I want to get in Kuldeep Nair. Uh, sir, I mean, you've seen it all. You've been there while About history to. was being written. So tell us, as uh, from that vantage point that you have, of uh, where have we come today as far as Mahatma Gandhi's legacy is concerned? And what do you think uh, would be the most important thing in terms of from uh, the Mahatma Gandhi's legacy for India, for, uh, India right now? Can you hear us, Mr. Nair? All right. We seem to have lost the audio connection over there. We'll just try to establish that. But, uh, but just coming back, Amritala ji, to the political legacy of Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. concepts such as non-violence, uh, I mean, ahimsa, I mean, the world took note of it. But in India, you see conflicts almost on a daily basis. We've seen what's been happening across the world also. We, I mean, we've seen what's been happening in France. And ahimsa is more, uh, more relevant than anything else today in today's world. And nobody seems to be talking about it. That's the sad part. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you brought up something which is extremely important. It was not just the ideals, you know, and uh, the principles for which he stood, but it was also the methods. Mm. As he said that if uh, the, the right method is as important as the aim, mm. you cannot achieve a good end mm. without using the right means. Right. And it's actually very profound mm. because what happens is that when you start using the wrong means, you actually end up at the wrong end. Mm. It's very difficult to actually reach the right end while using wrong means. Yeah. Because in the process, you are changed and around you, what you are trying to change also changes, changes in that direction. And I think more than anything else, he understood that if you are going to establish and live in a democratic order, mm. especially in a country and in a world mm. that is increasingly full of diversity mm. of all kinds, and people have, it's a globalized world, mm. and people have to learn to live together with their differences. Right. Unless you all agree mm. that we are going to be non-violent, mm. There is no other way of survival. Let mm. me take the example of what happened two days ago mm. in France, in yeah. Paris. Now, there is no doubt that some people were incensed mm. by the kind of cartoons that that magazine had been uh, bringing out. And they have a right to bring out the cartoons and other people have a right to be incensed. Mm. If only we had a compact that mm. all the differences and anger is going to be expressed through non-violent means. Mm. If the people who were angry had brought 50,000 people in a demonstration outside that magazine, mm. that would have taken the cause forward. Here, the use of violence mm. is what has made that baby genuine anger mm. into an unacceptable anger. Absolutely. You know, so I think it's very important for us... I mean, to understand this, that we cannot, if today in India, the Bodos and the tea tribes right. and the plains people, mm. the Hindus and the Muslims, the scheduled castes and the upper castes, if we all try to solve our men and women, solve our problems through violence, can we solve any problem? We can only disintegrate. Uh, an eye for an blind. eye. Yeah. An eye for an eye can leave everybody only Blind. blind. As it's an Gandhi obvious truth, it. but we don't recognize it. Absolutely. You know, it sounds very simple and plain, mm. but actually it is at the heart of a democratic right. order. 
Absolutely, it is indeed and more relevant to us uh, than any uh, time else perhaps in history before. We have with us Kuldeep Nair of course and also uh, our says think uh, Mr. Rakesh Sinha also joins us. Thank you very much both of you. Mr. Nair, first I'll come to you. I mean, uh, the question that I was asking you from your vantage point because you've seen history literally being written and you've written bits of it through your journalistic years. So uh, tell us, I mean, how relevant is uh, Mahatma Gandhi for today's modern India? Because a lot of the people seem to have forgotten his ideals and his ideas. See, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was really the idea of India. And the idea of India, according to him and what he preached was that India was a secular state, democratic and egalitarian. So this was, this was his idea. But I give you a very interesting uh, instance about uh, this violence part. There was great killing in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord Mountbatten was uh, in Delhi and uh, so he, there was also a lot of uh, disturbance in the north. But Gandhiji went to Calcutta, only one person. And he gave an order or, to the people or asked the people that you surrender the arms. Within 24 hours, all the arms were surrendered. Compared to Lord Mountbatten, who had all the forces in Delhi in, in uh, around Punjab, etc., couldn't do anything. But here is one man, border police or whatever you can say. Now, there was uh, a Punjabi from my state uh, who was a refugee. And he also came to Gandhiji at that time and said, Bapu, here is the knife. These uh, people had killed my only 12-year-old child. So Gandhiji says that now see how many orphans are there. Pick up a Muslim orphan of 12 years age and bring him up just like your son. According to the tenets of Islam, now, this was Gandhi. Gandhi who gave this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, idea or this idea preaching or this uh, kind of message to India that whatever religion you may be following, mm -hmm. and you are, will be Hindus, Muslim, Sikh, Kasai, Christians. But remember, the idea of India is that we are a pluralistic state and we do not differentiate between people on the basis of religion. Mm -hmm. So this is what uh, Gandhi, and I still take one more instance I remember. I was present there at that prayer meeting. Mm -hmm. In the prayer meeting, Gandhiji used to hold prayer meeting every evening. Mm -hmm. And in the prayer meeting, there used to be recitation of Quran the recit and the uh, reading of Bible and Bhagavad Gita. Mm. Uh, Bible first, Quran second, and Bhagavad Gita last. Now, after one day, uh, one person got up, and he was from Punjab, a refugee like me who had come, and he, he had lost everything, his relations, everything, and he was angry. Mm. He said, Gandhiji, I, Bapu, we don't want to hear this uh, Quran. Now, Gandhiji said, okay, all right, there will be no, no meeting today because that's the, the crux of the meeting. So there was no meeting. Mm. The second day, again, the meeting was there and this man came back and said, Gandhiji, I take back my objection. And then this uh, thing was started. So Gandhi's message to the people was, and, and as I see today in India, in a strange kind of uh, uh, wind is blowing, a hot wind. The Gandhiji message was that, look here, this India, with so many cultures, religions, castes, uh, area, uh, provinces, languages, etc., mm -hmm. we belong to one country, one nation. And there would be just like in a garden, there would be different kind of flowers, but the garden remains one. Similarly, India with various culture, with various religion, caste, uh, 
what the, they are only right. one one India, Absolutely. and we all belong to it. So that was the Gandhi's approach. All right, so I mean, thank you very much, uh, Kuldeep Nair, for sharing that little slice of history with us. Uh, Rakesh and I, I'll come to you because, uh, I mean, uh, we've been seeing a lot of questions being raised over Mahatma Gandhi uh, over the past uh, uh, year or so, especially since the rhetoric, the political rhetoric in this country became very charged. And you have uh, fringe organizations uh, saying all sorts of things. So in terms of Gandhiji's legacy, how would you view it? Look, Gandhi, uh, if we, we assess Gandhi, we have three d different dimensions. First, he addresses the civilizational question. That's why Gandhi has always been relevant in our civilizational discourse. Whenever there is a crisis in the Western civilization, now Gandhi is remembered. Gandhi is one person from the East who is a bridge between the East and the West for the dialogue on the various issues which are relevant to the civilization nowadays. Second most important thing of Gandhi is that he believed in social egalitarianism. He was the man of action. Just remember, uh, uh, just after civil disobedience moment, when the nation was surcharged by the anti-imperialist movement, he had given much more importance to the social question also. He led a Harijan Yatra all over the country for nine months. For the integration of the Harijans, he brought out the Harijan magazine. So he was not the man who was speaking just in an academic sense. A third most important thing which I consider for Gandhi and for this country very important that during the anti-imperialist movement, he introduced the decolonized discourse. He brought out the themes, phrases, concepts from the Indian culture, Indian civilizational traditions. Mm. He was the first man who turned this anti-imperialist discourse from the, from the Indian point of view. That, that is the greatest charm which we get from the Gandhi. Mm. And still we, remember, we, we believe that India needs the decolonized mind. Mm. We are much more dependent in, social, in the field of social science on the Western concept and Western ideology. Right. Look, knowledge is a universal thing, whether it is, a pro, it, is, it is from the East or the West. But see, the, from right. the right from individualism to postmodernism, liberalism, neoliberalism, every theory is coming from the West. Mm. Here Gandhi is very relevant. He is the first work that uh, uh, Hind Swaraj, it was a critic of the Western civilization. It was not a critic in that he was degrading the Western civilization. He was a creating a dialogue in the, and addressing the posterity. Right. Last question, as far as secularism is concerned, hmm. Gandhi, Ga Gandhi adopted the Indian way of uh, uh, secularism, not the Western way of uh, civilization, which is uh, tottering. Uh, just after 9-11, we just see the, how West is responding to the Islam uh, and other Mr. questions. Mr. Sinha, that, 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 that's my entire point. Islam as far as, I mean, you're saying these things, and, uh, I mean, I, I completely agree with you on them, but there are so many people in our country right now who are questioning Mahatma Gandhi's legacy, who are saying his uh, assassin should be venerated, who are saying all sorts of such things. That is no, uh, is, uh, the, the fact that he is there on um, currency notes, that should be removed. So, uh, what do you talk to, uh, how do you, what do you think about uh, those comments that are coming in? Look, in a country of 125 uh, crore people, if there are hundreds of the handful of people, they are questioning that. If there is a democratic debate, no, no thinker, no philosophy is free from critical debate and discussion. But if it is a democratic debate, academic debate, that's fine. But someone is questioning the Gandhi's existence, the Gandhi's presence. That, 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 that is not much relevant. Even in America, mm. there are certain people who are worshipping the assassin of the Lincoln. That, that, mm. that hardly matters. Here, what matter? We should not focus. We should not, not give much attention to such people because they derive identity and legitimacy when we, we debate such people. Right. So what we say that on the question of secularism, Gandhi brought out the Indian tradition of secularism. Till now, the, our social scientist has always quoted the Western liberalism, Western secularism. Right. Now we see All right, how so we Western get your point, is responding to the world order. All right. Here, Indian. All right, we get your point. No, we no, get I'm your just point. completing that that, that. that will remain incomplete okay. because. Yeah. All right, because I wanted to get in Mridhra's... Uh, Indian, book, Indian way of secularism is that we... we 
is 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 just like giving importance to diversity we are the people mm. here is just see in india there is a second oldest mosque in india cheraman mosque in malwar this shows that the, the hindu civilization which grew and which is uh, continuity which can be marked as continuity with change their civilization has always given importance to the religions cultures not because the constitution says because we inherit from our civilization and from our legacies that's why we say that at present if gandhi is very relevant when mm. we 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 discourse on secularism too all right uh, brithan mukherjee i want to move the sub, uh, conversation a little bit further from here i mean this is an endless uh, thing of uh, i mean what has this, been happening this, and as uh, no no this reminds me yes go ahead mr dyer uh, this reminds me one incident very important see when uh, babri masjid was demolished so somebody remarked that gandhi ji was shot on the 30th january but he died today when the mosque has been demolished so that was a very interesting remark which i thought i would share with you all right uh, we'll also come to you uh, for the economics of gandhi ji because that is also very relevant today mrithala mukherjee as far as i mean india wants to become a free market economy and we want greed is good as a famous movie it once said and that kind of an idea i mean that was not what gandhi ji had imagined the idea of the indian economy to be it was to right down to the masses right down to the last man yeah i think that uh, there are some principles in his understanding which uh, we need to bring back into focus we started out with that hmm. first of course is that the focus on what these policies mean for the poorest in our country mm. and i think that is something we need to if we are today discussing the land acquisition bill and whether it should be reformed or not or is it good i think the questions that we should be asking is not whether it's going to make life easier for the industrialist so that he can get the land in 3 years or 5 years uh, rather than 7 but what does it actually do to the people whose land is taken away mm. without their consent what does it do to people who lose their livelihood even more than the land owners right. who get the compensation what about people who work on that land mm. what about people who work around that land what mm. about the forests around on the basis of which people live what about the tribals who lose not just the sources of livelihood but their whole way of living and their civilization right. i think there are very fundamental questions mm. which did get raised in this debate on the land acquisition bill but today when we are talking about it i find these are only thing we are talking about it ease of business ease of uh and bring it down to perhaps no, bring so it down I, to just the fact that so compensation should be good enough just monetary that's not the issue because yeah. the the issues are much more fundamental right. the issues are also that the people who are losing livelihoods are yeah. also losing ways of life right what are you doing to give them a different way of life so we don't that's because we are not treating those human beings hmm. as equal to the ones to Right, so whom we are looking at as the beneficiaries of so this in, process. So in in a sense, the the, the entire Isn't talk it? about just job creation is not just about a yeah. job for you. It's just yeah. about also about a way of life, and that yeah. is what Mahatma Gandhi was thinking. Actually, about. Actually, Gandhi ji always said, you know, that it shouldn't be mass production, but the production by the masses, hmm. so that whatever is earned goes to each and every person who has contributed towards it, hmm. towards that production. Hmm. uh um, like uh af- when he came to india in 1915 between 1917 and 1918 uh, uh, three small satyagrahs mm. took place mm. you know champaran satyagraha after that there was between mill owners and mm. the laborers mm. of amdabad mills mm. right. and there uh, like one can see very clearly that uh, one of the mill owners was in the procession along with the laborers with gandhi ji mm. wanted their wages to be raised yeah. they should get certain percentage of the profit and uh, they were able to negotiate and both the parties were happy mm. this was gandhi ji's way of uh, helping everyone mm. it's not that the production should stop it's not that the mills should stop but those who are engaged in the production right. they must get enough 
All right, Kuldeep yeah. Nair, uh, the final word to you, obviously. Uh, the fact is uh, that, oh. I mean, uh, poor Gandhiji did not live to see his legacy be fulfilled. And what we've done with that is a big question mark today. So uh, in terms of just economics, you've seen, I mean, India through the ages in terms of from being a, almost a closed economy to the liberalization and to, to the present stage where we're trying to capture our space in the world. So, uh, I mean, how relevant are Gandhiji's economic ideas to us today about the way of life, about getting everybody in? Well, the Gandhiji believed in self-sufficiency of villages. And uh, so today we see that since there isn't much in the villages, no amenities, no job facilities, so now rural people are coming to the urban and so urbanization is taking place. While uh, and that's the reason there are slums, there are very crowded cities, etc. Instead of that, amenities and facilities should have gone to villages, and which where we have failed. Gandhiji would have liked us that villages should be the places where people can live uh, independently with all facilities. After all, till today, is in 70% countries the rural country, mm. and the, we have not been able to provide things which uh, villages should have drinking water or other facilities. And that's the reason that you find that people from villages are coming to the uh, cities looking for jobs and, uh, and s sitting somewhere or lying there. I think we have to, where we are failing is that we are not providing all these facilities in the villages and that was Gandhiji's message. All right, so that certainly was Gandhiji's message. I, I mean, I, I just have about one minute, and I think if, if the, there's a broader consensus, we will give it to Kuldeep Nayarji to just recount for us anything that you think uh, would perhaps Gandhiji would like to, uh, or any instance or anecdote you remember of Gandhiji that you could share with us as we remember the hundred years of him coming back to India from South Africa. The only thing I can remember is that Gandhiji, during one prayer meeting, said, and he was wearing all these uh, specks. And he take, took off the specks. Right? And he said, remember, Hindu and Muslims are married to ice. And uh, I do not want to see an India where there is ever any difference between the religions, between Hindus and Muslims. Because after all, we have fought independence for an idea of India. And the idea of India is pluralistic democratic society. All right, uh, we'll leave it over there. What uh, lovely words, Mr. Kuldeep Nayar. Thank you very much for quoting Mahatma Gandhi to us and uh, li really reliving that history with us. Also, Mr. Rakesh Sena, thank you very much for coming in and sharing perspective. Mridhara Mukherjee and Varsha Das, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. So uh, that's our presentation on uh, the centenary of Mahatma Gandhi's return to India from South Africa. But a lot to, of, uh, for us as Indians to reflect upon about what we have done with Mahatma Gandhi's legacy. Do let us know what you think. Thanks so much for watching.